time, energy, and money. They allocate their time, energy, and money efficiently, in ways conducive to building wealth. Efficiency is one of the most important components of wealth accumulation. Simply, people who become wealthy allocate their time, energy, and money in ways consistent with enhancing their net worth. Although both prodigious accumulators and underaccumulators of wealth state similar goals about achieving wealth, these groups have completely different orientations when it comes to how much time they actually spend on wealth building activities. Pause allocate nearly twice the number of hours per month to planning their financial investments as UAWs do. There is a strong positive correlation between investment planning and wealth accumulation. UAWs spend less time than pause consulting with professional investment advisors, searching for quality accountants, attorneys, and investment counselors, and attending investment planning seminars. Pause, on average, spend less time worrying about their economic well-being. We have determined that under-accumulators are much more concerned than prodigious accumulators with the prospects of not being wealthy enough to retire in comfort. Never accumulating significant wealth. Are their concerns realistic? Yes. Yet UAW spend more time worrying about these issues than taking proactive steps to change their tendencies to overconsume and underinvest. What type of person recently indicated that he was afraid and worried about the following two issues? 1. Experiencing a significant reduction in his standard of living. 2. Not having an income high enough to satisfy his family's purchasing habits. Who is this person? Perhaps he is a mail carrier with two children in college. Or perhaps he is a single, low-income parent who has to raise three children. Do you envision a middle-aged corporate manager who recently found out that his position would be eliminated? Certainly these are logical guesses. People in these categories would very likely express fear about having to reduce their standard of living and not having the income to satisfy their family's buying habits. But none of these people is the one we are about to profile. The respondent who actually expressed these fears and worries is a surgeon in his 50s whom we shall call Dr. South, see Table 3 to 1. He is married and has four children. Why should he be worried about his standard of living and his income? Could it be that he's down on his luck, perhaps unable to continue to practice medicine because of a disability? No. Actually he is a fine physician who earned more than $700,000 during the year prior to our interview with him. But in spite of his high income, his net worth in real terms is declining. He has reasons to be afraid and worried. Dr. North is very similar to Dr. South in age, income, and family composition. But Dr. North is a paw. His profile is also detailed later in this chapter. Dr. North has far fewer worries than Dr. South. He is not afraid of being forced to reduce his standard of living. Unlike Dr. South, he is not concerned that his income will not be high enough to satisfy his family's purchasing habits. This is especially interesting given that both Dr. South and Dr. North have similar incomes. The case studies that follow will introduce you to these physicians and their families. You will learn a lot about how each man makes use of his time, energy, and money. But before we profile these two physicians in detail, we will discuss the income and wealth accumulating habits of physicians in general. Table 3 to 1 Concerns, Fears, and Worries, Dr. North vs. Dr. South Doctors, Pause and was. On average, physicians earn more than four times the income of the average American household. $140,000 versus $33,000. But Dr. South and Dr. North are hardly average physicians. They are gifted and highly trained specialists. In fact, the average annual income for someone in their specialty is more than $300,000. But again, they are extraordinary even among their cohorts. Last year they each earned more than $700,000. In spite of his income, Dr. South has a relatively small level of accumulated wealth. He spends a lot, invests little. Our research has found that physicians in general do not tend to be wealth accumulators. In fact, among all major high-income producing occupations, physicians have a significantly low propensity to accumulate substantial wealth. For every one doctor in the PAW group, there are two in the UAW category. Why are doctors lagging behind on the wealth scale? There are several reasons. Foremost among them is the correlation between wealth and education. This relationship may surprise some people. For all high-income earners, those earning at least $100,000 annually, the relationship between education and wealth accumulation is negative. High-income PAWs are significantly less likely than UAWs to hold graduate degrees, law degrees, or medical degrees. Millionaires typically indicate on our survey business owner with some college, four-year college graduate, or no college. Warning. 
Parents should not suggest that their children drop out of college and start a business. Most businesses fail within a few years of their conception. Only a small minority of business owners ever earns a six-figure income. But those who do tend to accumulate more wealth than others in the same income cohort. The some college, four-year college graduate, and no college types who have high incomes often had a head start on many well-educated workers. Doctors and other well-educated professionals get a very late start in the earnings race. It is difficult to accumulate wealth when one is in school. The longer one stays in school, the longer one postpones producing an income and building wealth. Most experts on wealth agree that the earlier one starts investing one's income, the greater the opportunity to accumulate wealth. Mr. Denzi, for example, is a business owner with two years of technical school training in data processing. He started working and building wealth at the age of 22. Today, 30 years later, he has benefited greatly from the meteoric increase in the value of his pension plan. In sharp contrast, consider the situation of Dr. Dokes, who graduated from high school the same year as Mr. Denzi. Dr. Dokes opened his private medical practice more than a dozen years after his classmate, Mr. Denzi, started a business. During that 12-year period, Dr. Dokes spent his time studying and spending his savings, his parents' money, and money he borrowed for tuition and living expenses. During the same time, Mr. Denzi, who designated himself as not college material, focused his resources on building his business and becoming financially independent. Who is in the UAW category today? Is it the not college material business owner, Mr. Denzi, or the valedictorian of his high school class, Dr. Dokes? The answer is obvious. Mr. Denzi is a prototypical PA, while Dr. Dokes is a UAW. Interestingly, both earned approximately the same income last year, nearly $160,000. But Mr. Denzi has five to six times the wealth of his high school classmate. And he has no debt. Mr. Denzi can teach us all something about accumulating wealth. Begin earning and investing early in your adult life. That will enable you to outpace the wealth accumulation levels of even the so-called gifted kids from your high school class. Remember, wealth is blind. It cares not if its patrons are well educated. So the authors have an excuse. How else does one explain why two experts on wealth are not wealthy? In part, because they spent a combined total of nearly 20 years pursuing higher education. Another reason very well educated people tend to lag behind on the wealth scale has to do with the status ascribed to them by society. Doctors, as well as others with advanced degrees, are expected to play their parts. Mr. Denzi is a small business owner. In spite of being wealthy, he is not expected by society to live in an exclusive neighborhood. He would not be out of place living in a modest home or driving a nondescript sedan. His domestic overhead is significantly lower than Dr. Dokes's. Many people tell us that you can judge a book by its cover, meaning that high-grade doctors, lawyers, accountants, and so on are expected to live in expensive homes. They also are expected to dress and drive in a style congruent with their ability to perform their professional duties. How do you judge the professionals you patronize? Too many people judge them by display factors. Extra points are given to those who wear expensive clothes, drive luxury automobiles, and live in exclusive neighborhoods. They assume a professional is likely to be mediocre, even incompetent, if he lives in a modest home and drives a three-year-old Ford Crown Victoria. Very, very few people judge the quality of the professionals they use by net worth criteria. Many professionals have told us that they must look successful to convince their customers slash clients that they are. Of course, there are exceptions. But people who spend many years in college, professional school, or graduate school are more likely to have higher levels of household overhead than less educated people. As a rule, doctors have exceptionally high levels of domestic overhead. The concern in many of these households is with consuming, not investing. Physicians often find that there are disadvantages to living in affluent neighborhoods. People who live in expensive areas are often bombarded with solicitations from cold calling investment experts. Many of these callers assume that people in upscale areas have money to invest. In reality, many people who live in luxury have little money left over after funding their high consumption lifestyles. Some naive cold callers purchase prospect lists that fit two criteria. First, prospects must be physicians. Second, they must live in exclusive neighborhoods. It's no wonder physicians are the favorite targets of some of America's most aggressive sellers of investment ideas. Too often doctors who receive such solicitations assume that the callers are just as professional as physicians. Many physicians have told us that they have had bad experiences with investing via cold callers. In fact, many have been burned so badly that they never again invested in the stock market.
This is unfortunate given the overall growth in the real value of the equity market. And, in rejecting the stock market, they figured that left them with more money for spending. This attitude is not as rare as one might think. A plastic surgeon added that he had three boats and five cars but hadn't gotten around to assembling a pension plan. Financial investments? Didn't have those, either. Speaking off his colleagues, the surgeon said, I don't know even one guy who hasn't been beaten to death in the financial markets. As a result, they don't have anything. At least I'm going to enjoy spending my money. Later on, this doctor summed up his financial philosophy, money, he said, with a wave of his hand, is the most easily renewable resource, Thomas J. Stanley, why you're not as wealthy as you should be, Medical Economics, July 1992. What other factors explain why so many doctors are members of the UAW group? Our research shows that they are generally unselfish. On average, they contribute a higher percentage of their incomes to noble causes than do other high-income producers. Also, doctors are among the least likely to receive inheritances from their parents. Their less educated brothers and sisters are significantly more likely to inherit money. In some cases, physicians are asked by their elderly parents to help out, their less fortunate brothers and sisters after, the parents, are no longer able to help pay their bills. These findings are detailed in Chapter 6. Doctors often allocate large amounts of their time to serving patients. They rarely work fewer than 10 hours a day, thus expending most of their time, energy, and intellect on patients. In so doing, they tend to neglect their economic well-being. Some doctors figure that working hard translates into a large income and that, therefore, there is no need to design a household budget. Some ask why they should waste time planning a domestic budget and investments when there is so much income to be made. Many high-income producing UAWs feel this way. Paws tend to have just the opposite feelings. To them, money is a resource that should never be squandered. They know that planning, budgeting, and being frugal are essential parts of building wealth, even for very high-income producers. Even high-income producers must live below their means if they intend to become financially independent. And if you're not financially independent, you will spend an increasing amount of your time and energy worrying about your socio-economic future. Planning and controlling. Planning and controlling consumption are key factors underlying wealth accumulation. Thus, one should expect that paws like Dr. North take the time to plan their budgets. They do. Conversely, Dr. South has no control over his family's consumption, other than his household's income limit. We asked Dr. South and North about their respective planning and controlling systems. Question, does your household operate on a fairly well thought out annual budget? Dr. South, no. Dr. North, yes, absolutely. Operating a household without a budget is akin to operating a business without a plan, without goals, and without direction. The Norths have a budget that calls for them to invest at least one-third of their pre-tax household income each year. In fact, during the year that we interviewed Dr. North, he and his wife invested nearly 40% of their annual pre-tax income. How were they able to do this? In short, they consume at the same level as the average family that earns about one-third as much as they do. What about the Souths? They consume at the same level as the average household that earns nearly two times more than they do. In fact, their high peruse of credit is more in line with that of households that earn several million dollars each year. The Souths essentially spend all of or more than their income each year. This income is their only restraint. We asked both doctors another set of questions. 1. Do you know how much your family spends each year for food, clothing, and shelter? 2. Do you spend a lot of time planning your financial future? 3. Are you frugal? You probably predicted the outcome. Dr. South responded with three no's, while Dr. North responded in true Paul fashion, with three yeses. Consider the frugal orientation of Dr. North. He stated emphatically, for instance, that he never bought a suit that was not offered at a discount or a special price. This is not to suggest that Dr. North is poorly dressed. Nor does he wear cheap suits. Rather, he purchases quality clothing, but not at full price and never on impulse. This behavior was part of his socialization process as a youth. When I was going to school, my wife taught. We had a small income. Even then we always had a rule, to save, even then we saved. You can't invest without something. The first thing is to save. Even when I was 11 years old, I saved my first $50 from working in a grocery store. It's just like today, only today the number of zeros change. More zeros, but it's the same rule, same discipline. You must take advantage of investment opportunities. You have to have something to take advantage of excellent opportunities. It's part of my background. 
Dr. South reported having just the opposite orientation. How much did he and his family spend on clothing during the year prior to our interview? About $30,000, see Table 3-2. to two. Thus, the South spend nearly as much on clothing each year as the average American household earns in total, that is. $33,000. The Home Team Most high-income households consist of traditional married couples with children. Both the South and North households are traditional. We determined long ago that the habits of both husband and wife account for variations in accumulating wealth. Your spouse's orientation toward thrift, consumption, and investing is a significant factor in understanding your household's position on the wealth scale. Who is the tightwad in your household? In the case of Dr. North's family, both he and his wife fit the profile. Both live well below their means. Both contribute to planning their well-thought-out annual budget. Neither objects to buying used motor vehicles. Both can tell you how much their family spends each year for a variety of products and services. Neither objected to sending their children to public elementary and high schools. Both place a high priority on being financially independent. Yet these goals never translated into short-changing their three children. The parents funded their children's college educations as well as their graduate school and law school tuition and fees. They also provided them with funds to purchase homes and for related expenditures. The Norths paid for these expenditures out of investments that they set aside for their children. Conversely, the Souths are not investors. Almost all such allocations in the South household come from current earned income. What if your household generates even a moderately high income and both you and your spouse are frugal? You have the foundation for becoming and maintaining PAW status. On the other hand, it is very difficult for a married couple to accumulate wealth if one is a spendthrift. A household divided in its financial orientation is unlikely to accumulate significant wealth. Even worse are cases in which both the wife and her husband are spendthrifts. This is the domestic situation the Souths find themselves in today. Interestingly, Dr. South reported to us that he is the tightwad in his household. Is he? True, he takes aim at the shopping and consumption habits of his spouse. But spending all or even most of their annual income takes a team effort. Both are hyper-consumers. Both contribute to their lower-than-expected position on the wealth scale. Let's evaluate Dr. South's wealth-building performance. He is responsible for his household's income. And there is no argument that he is extraordinary in this regard. His performance places him in the 99.5 percentile of all income earners in America. But he is also responsible, in part, for making other decisions for his household. He buys the motor vehicles and financial advice. He also makes investment decisions. But neither he nor his wife does any budgeting for the family. Mrs. South is responsible for buying the family's clothing. In one year she spent about $30,000 on clothes for herself and her family. She also contributed significantly to the decision to spend more than $40,000 for country club fees and related expenses. Both decided to spend $107,000 per year in mortgage payments. Most UAWs will tell you that their big mortgage helps reduce their taxable income. Of course, if the Souths keep saving money this way, they may never be able to retire. Often people who purchase expensive homes and automobiles are criticized for their extravagant lifestyle. But at least homes, in most cases, hold their value, if only in a nominal sense. Even automobiles hold some value for a few years after they are purchased. Large allocations for homes and automobiles can have a dampening effect on wealth building, but again, at least you can trade up, out, or down with such items. There are worse culprits. How much is the South's $30,000 clothing purchase that they made last year worth today? How much will the $7,000 vacation they recently took be worth tomorrow? How much value is there remaining from the more than $40,000 they spent last year for country club related expenses? Add to these gourmet restaurant patronage, maid services, tutors, lawn care slash landscaping services, decorating consultants, insurance, and more. The South's consumption habits are related to the fact that they have no centralized control over their expenditures. Much of their consumption is a function of independent action in this household drama. This is not the case in the North household. Dr. North and his wife both play active roles in budgeting and spending. They plan together and consult with each other regarding expenditures. We will detail their system. But first let us examine the South's situation. Mrs. South is responsible for purchasing a wide variety of products and services for her household. She did not consult with anyone before spending $30,000 for clothing last year. She does her thing, and her husband does his. She has her set of credit cards, and he has his. Mrs. South is a particularly ardent patron of upscale department stores. 
These include Neiman Marcus, Saks Fifth Avenue, and Lord & Taylor. She carries credit cards for each of these stores. In addition, she and her husband hold a MasterCard, Gold, and a Visa, Preferred, card. Dr. South also has the American Express Platinum card. What's the problem? Often Dr. and Mrs. South have little or no idea what their counterpart is buying or how much each is spending. This is especially true for soft goods and intangibles, such as clothes, gifts, and entertaining. Both are susceptible to solicitations from everyone from store clerks to financial advisors, from automobile sales personnel to credit officers at banks. If you were one of these people, who would you call? Who would you keep abreast of new product and service offerings? Who would you advise about a special showing of the latest fashions and motor vehicles? Why does Mrs. South spend so much money? In classic UAW fashion, her husband has encouraged her to do so. He was the product of a high-income producing, indulgent set of parents. He, in turn, has given his wife almost a blank check when it comes to shopping. And, of course, the South's associate with other hyper-consumers. But there is something she and her husband don't know. They are unique. They are not typical consumers. No one ever told them that most people in their income bracket, including the Norths, never spend money like the Souths do. Unfortunately, the Souths never learned about the prodigious accumulators of wealth. The Norths are very different from the Souths in their spending behavior. Both Dr. and Mrs. North come from backgrounds of frugality and thrift. Throughout their marriage they have communicated with each other about resource allocations. Their budgeting system is basic to their controlled consumption lifestyle. Unlike the Souths, the Norths own no credit cards for upscale department stores. That's right. The North family, whose net worth is more than 18 times that of the Souths, $7,500,000 versus $400,000, holds no cards from Neiman Marcus or from Saks Fifth Avenue or from Lord & Taylor. They are only special occasion shoppers at such stores. Almost all of their household purchases are placed on one central credit card, a Visa, preferred, card. Both their purchases are listed on one single statement each month. Each month they determine how much remains to be allocated for each consumption category, and at the end of each year they refer to these statements to compute their total expenditures for each category. Using this statement facilitates budgeting and making appropriations for the following year. Most important, their planning, budgeting, and consuming are coordinated events. Unlike the Souths, the Norths have one joint checking account to help facilitate the budgeting of items not paid for with their credit card. What if you want to budget but don't like the process? We recently interviewed a CPA who offers a household budgeting and consumption planning service. Mr. Arthur Gifford has several hundred high-income producing clients. Most are either self-employed professionals or business owners. Some are PAWs. Some are UAWs. We asked Mr. Gifford who uses his budgeting and consumption planning system. His response was predictable in light of the case studies of the Souths and Norths. Only those clients with considerable wealth want to know exactly how much their family spends on each and every category. Mr. Gifford is correct. But aren't PAWs usually price sensitive when it comes to purchasing services? Not always. They are much less price sensitive when buying services that will help them control their family's consumption behavior. Do you know exactly how much your family spent last year for each and every category of product and service? Without such knowledge, it's difficult to control your spending. If you can't control your spending, you're unlikely to accumulate prodigious amounts of wealth. A good start is to keep an accurate record of each and every expenditure that your family makes each month. Or ask your accountant to help you set up a system for tabulating and categorizing these expenditures. Then work with her to develop a budget. The goal is to enable you to set aside for investing purposes at least 15% of your pre-tax income each year. By the way, this 15% method is Mr. Gifford's simple strategy for becoming affluent. Car Shopping Methods The Souths outpace the Norths in several consumption categories. During the year prior to our interview, they allocated six times more money for motor vehicles than the Norths, $72,200 versus $12,000. Dr. South also purchased a $65,000 Porsche during the year of our interview. Dr. South is, in fact, a true connoisseur of fine motor vehicles. He spends little time preparing a budget for his household and even less time planning his financial future. But he has a very different orientation when it comes to purchasing automobiles. There is an inverse relationship between the time spent purchasing luxury items such as cars and clothes and the time spent planning one's financial future. High income producing UAWs like Dr. South spend a great deal of their incomes on expensive automobiles and clothing. But it takes more than money to acquire and maintain large inventories of luxury goods. 
Such purchases have to be planned. It takes time to shop, and it takes time to care for large quantities of expensive high-status artifacts. Time, energy, and money are finite resources, even among high-income generators. Our research indicates that even these top earners cannot have their cake and eat it, too. Dr. North and Paws in general, on the other hand, allocate their spare time to activities that they hope will enhance their wealth, see Table 3-6 to six later in Chapter. Such activities include studying and planning their investment strategies and managing current investments. We will study this issue in greater detail later in this chapter. Conversely, UAWs such as Dr. South work hard to maintain and enhance their high standard of living. Often these high-income producing UAWs, Dr. South included, outspend their six-figure incomes. So how do they balance their need to maintain their high standard of living with a finite income? Many aggressively shop for bargains. The South Method Examine the activities that Dr. South undertakes prior to purchasing an automobile. You might get the impression that he is a tightwad. Most UAWs like Dr. South bolster their hyper-consumption behavior by telling would-be critics that everything they buy is purchased near cost at cost, below cost, and so on. It is true that Dr. South is an aggressive bargain shopper. But he just paid more than $65,000 for an exotic sports car. Is this really a bargain? Dr. South made this purchase at near dealer's cost. But what were the costs of this so-called deal in time and effort? Most high-income generators, whether they are PAWS or UAWs, work more than 40 hours a week. Typically, the amount of time remaining each week is allocated in ways that are congruent with their goals. All too often high-income producing UAWs spend countless hours studying the market, but not the stock market. They can tell you the names of the top auto dealers, but not the top investment advisors. They can tell you how to shop and spend, but they can't tell you how to invest. They know the styles, prices, and availability at various car dealers, but they know little or nothing about the various values of equity market offerings. As an example, contrast Dr. South's most recent automobile shopping activities with that of typical millionaires. On average, the American millionaire employs four to five simple bargain shopping techniques when buying a motor vehicle. Dr. South does it differently. He uses at least nine bargaining slash shopping tactics and strategies when negotiating with dealers. Consider the level of car purchasing knowledge Dr. South has recently acquired that will never pay capital gains or real dividends or enhance the productivity of his business. He now has knowledge about every Porsche dealer within a 400-mile radius of his home. Dr. South also can tell you immediately the dealer's cost on nearly every Porsche model, the cost of options and accessories, and the performance characteristics of most models. It takes much time and effort to acquire such information. Dr. South has an interesting style when purchasing automobiles. He first decides on the make and model of the vehicle he wants and the corresponding accessories. Then he goes all out into information seeking and negotiating. It is not unusual for him to shop around for months for the very best deal. In the process he usually discovers the dealer's cost on the vehicle. This is done prior to entering into serious negotiations with a dealer. Then he telephones all the dealers, his long list, and invites them to compete for his business. He has no problem buying a Porsche from a low price-oriented, out-of-town dealer. Those dealers who designate themselves as price-oriented are then placed on Dr. South's shortlist. The others are dropped from consideration. Dealers on his shortlist are contacted once again. During this stage of the process, Dr. South quizzes the dealers about their willingness to sell at below cost. While doing so, he reminds them of the low prices quoted by other dealers. He also asks about program slash off lease vehicles. But his heart is always set on a brand new model. At the end of the month, Dr. South recontacts all the low price oriented dealers. Dr. South does this because he feels that dealers have sales quotas and bank notes due at that time. He invites all these dealers to give their final lowest bid for his business. For his most recent purchase, during the last day of the month and after a flurry of phone calls, he finally accepted a bid from an out-of-town dealer. Dr. South is pennywise, pound foolish when purchasing motor vehicles. But he has convinced himself that he is a prudent buyer. After all, he spends much time and energy trying to buy cars at or near dealer cost. But perhaps dealer cost was too high a price to pay. It is difficult to accumulate wealth if you spend much of your time, energy, and money for a so-called dealer cost price on an extremely expensive motor vehicle. Consider this fact, most millionaires we have interviewed never in their lifetime spent near $65,000 for an automobile. In fact, as we will report in Chapter 4, more than half the millionaires we interviewed never paid more than $30,000 for a motor vehicle. Remember, though, 
Dr. South is not a millionaire. Certainly in terms of net worth, millionaires are better able to afford a $65,000 automobile. But they ignore such opportunities. As so often is said, that's why they're millionaires. Certainly the consumption of very expensive automobiles has a dampening effect on the probability that one will ever accumulate significant wealth. During the year we interviewed him, Dr. South spent more than $70,000 for his most recent motor vehicle purchase, related sales tax, and insurance. Yet for the same period, how much did he place in his pension plan? About $5,700. In other words, only about $1 in every $125 of his income was set aside for retirement. The amount of time Dr. South took to find the best deal on his car was also counterproductive. We estimated that it took him more than 60 hours to study, negotiate, and purchase his Porsche. How much time and effort does it take someone to place money in a pension plan? A small fraction of this time and energy. It is easy for Dr. South to say he wants to accumulate wealth, but his actions speak much louder than his words. Perhaps that explains why he has lost a considerable amount of wealth through imprudent investing. Investing when one has little or no intellectual basis for one's decisions often translates into major losses. The North Method Dr. North is not a connoisseur of motor vehicles, although he is price sensitive when making purchasing decisions. We asked Dr. North about his most recent automobile purchase. Remember that Dr. South's most recent purchase was the current year's model. Note that fewer than 25% of America's millionaires are driving the current year's model. And, of course, Dr. South is not a millionaire. Dr. North proudly informed us that he purchased his most recent automobile six years ago. We anticipate your question, do you mean he has not purchased a new automobile in six years? Not only has Dr. North not purchased a new automobile in six years, but the one he purchased six years ago was a three-year-old Mercedes-Benz 300 that he bought for $35,000. Dr. North loves the car, great price, excellent fuel economy, it's a diesel. And, of course, Diesel Mercedes often can last for hundreds of thousands of miles before they need an overhaul. It also has classic styling. How much time and energy did Dr. North expend in purchasing his Mercedes? Let's examine his decision-making process. First, he decided that he needed to replace his old car. After all, it was 20 years old. He knew that many European luxury automobiles depreciate rapidly during the first three years following their initial purchase. So he figured that he might be able to save a considerable amount if he purchased a three-year-old Mercedes-Benz. He confirmed this speculation by determining the original retail price of the model he was interested in purchasing. A quick trip to a local dealer was all that was required to gain this knowledge. Dr. North then decided that his best choice would be a three-year-old model. He telephoned a few dealers and advised them of his interest. He also examined several advertisements in the classified section of the paper. Finally he decided on a low mileage model offered by a local dealer. As he explained, Automobiles? I have always placed a premium on quality. But I never lease, never finance. I drive a Mercedes-Benz. Since I started my practice, I have only had two cars. The first, a Mercedes, I purchased new just after I opened my practice. Kept it 20 years. Then I bought my second car, a three-year-old Mercedes. I went to a dealer. He wanted to sell me a new one but it was $20,000 more than the used one on the lot. Then I just asked myself a simple question, is the pride of new car ownership and that's all it is, pride, worth $20,000? The cars are the same. The answer is no. The pride of new car ownership is not worth $20,000. The North method took only a few hours. Contrast this with Dr. South's automobile purchasing crusade, a process that took him at least 60 hours. And, of course, Dr. North likes to keep his cars for a long time. So his allocation of purchasing time is spread over several years. On average, he devotes less than an hour a year to purchasing motor vehicles. But Dr. South likes to buy a new car every year. Thus, his 60-hour project is typically allocated to only one year. Fears and Worries What do you spend time worrying about? Are your concerns congruent with wealth accumulation? Or do you spend time thinking about issues that are impediments to becoming affluent? How do PAWS and UAWs differ in regard to their fears and concerns? In simple terms, UAWs worry more than PAWS. PAWS and UAWs also worry about different issues. Overall, PAWS have significantly fewer concerns and fears than their counterparts. What if you spend much of your time thinking about a lot of issues that concern you? You will spend less time taking action to solve these problems. And what if your fears provide a foundation for increased spending? You may be a member of the UAW group.
fears and concerns can be both a cause for becoming a UAW as well as a result. Will a person who constantly worries about earning more money to enhance his lifestyle become wealthy? Probably not. Dr. South is not wealthy, in part because he concerns himself with such issues. Dr. North is wealthy today because he placed much less priority on standard of living issues than did Dr. South. Dr. South told us that 19 issues were of high or moderate concern to him, see Table 3 to 1. Dr. North was concerned with only about 7 issues. Thus, it's only logical to conclude that the Dr. Norths of this country have more time and energy to devote to wealth enhancing activities. Let's examine how these doctors' fears and worries, or lack of them, have affected their lives. The children of UAWs and PAWs. The Souths have four children. Two are adults. Dr. South has serious, well founded concerns about their future. UAWs tend to produce children who eventually become UAWs themselves. What is expected of children who are exposed to a household environment predicated upon very high consumption, few, if any, economic constraints, little planning or budgeting, no discipline, and pandering to every product related desire. Like their UAW parents, as adults, these children are often addicted to an undisciplined, high consumption lifestyle. Further, these children typically will never earn the incomes necessary to support the lifestyle to which they have grown accustomed. Certainly Dr. South's parents' indulgent lifestyle contributed to his becoming a UAW. And he learned so well. His lifestyle is even more consumption-oriented than that of his mother and father. His upper-middle-class lifestyle was never interrupted even when he was in graduate school and medical school. His parents paid for his home and all other expenses. They provided him with substantial gifts of cash each year. In essence, he never really had to change his consumption habits or standard of living after leaving home. Fortunately for him, he has the income to support his addiction to consumption. But what about his children? They have lived in a high-consumption environment that would be extremely difficult to replicate on their own. The curtain is coming down on the third generation. Dr. South indicated in our interviews with us that he believed his children would never generate even a fraction of the income he currently earns. In comparison, Dr. North's adult children are demonstrating more independence and discipline, in part because they have been exposed to a much more frugal, well-planned, and disciplined lifestyle. As we noted, the Norths consume at a level that is more congruent with a household earning less than one-third of their income. This living below their means is precisely why PAWs throughout the income spectrum tend to produce children who are economically disciplined and self-sufficient adults. PAWs tend to produce children who become PAWs. Dr. South, as indicated, has accumulated considerably less wealth than Dr. North. He is significantly less able than Dr. North to support the economic outpatient care of his adult children. But ironically it is Dr. South who is burdened by having economically dependent adult children. We questioned both Dr. South and Dr. North about their fears and worries concerning their children. As you may have already predicted, Dr. South is much more concerned about this issue. He specifically expressed fears of 1. Having adult children who think his wealth is their income. 2. Having to support his adult children financially. Imagine how disconcerting it is for someone like Dr. South to face the prospect of supporting his extended family. Chapters 5 and 6 will explore the implications of economic outpatient care in great detail. However, there is an important point to note at this time, having adult children who are UAWs greatly reduces the probability that their parents will ever become wealthy. Dr. South wonders where his children got the idea that their parents would provide them with substantial economic outpatient care. He worries that he will not have the resources to provide his children with all the subsidies his parents gave him. There is yet another fear Dr. South must face. He is becoming more and more worried that his children will not get along with each other. Much of this concern is rooted in their need for economic support from their parents. Dr. North does not worry about such issues. We asked both doctors about these types of concerns. Dr. South worried that 1. His family slash children will fight over his estate. Two. He will be accused of financially favoring one adult child over another. Are Dr. South's fears justified? Ask yourself this question, what is the greatest fear of the 30-year-old sons and daughters of the Dr. Souths of America? That the economic outpatient care they receive from their parents will stop. Many 30-something UAWs cannot maintain anywhere near the lifestyle they had while living with dad and mom. In fact, many are unable to purchase even a modest home without financial subsidies from their parents. It is not unusual for these rich kids to receive substantial cash and other financial gifts until they are in their late 40s or even early 50s. Often these adult UAWs compete with each other for their parents' wealth. 
What would you do if your economic subsidy was being threatened by the presence of your equally dependent brothers and sisters? Dr. South is not only worried about his problems, he is also worried about his children's problems. Consider for a moment the legacy he is leaving them. What are the ramifications of being an economically dependent adult? How much insecurity and fear will they have to deal with in the future? How will they be able to have harmonious, loving relationships with each other? These are among the issues Dr. South spends more and more time contemplating. Dr. North is much less concerned with such problems. His adult children are accustomed to living in a much more frugal and disciplined environment. They are less likely to have a perceived need for major doses of economic outpatient care. Taxes, Government, and Government Many high-income earners in America, both PAWS and UAWs, are greatly concerned about the actions of the federal government. These actions are external forces, those over which an individual has no control. Dr. South indicated that he feared four external forces that are government-related. Interestingly, these issues are not of major concern to Dr. North. Let's look at these four concerns. 1. Paying increasingly high federal income taxes. Both physicians think that the federal government is likely to require high-income producers to pay more in taxes. But tax increases are more the concern of Dr. South than of Dr. North. Why is Dr. South concerned about this issue? Because he needs to maximize his realized income to support his hyper-consumption lifestyle. If the government requires Dr. South to pay a higher share of his income, his lifestyle will be threatened. What about Dr. North? He told us that he had a low level of concern over the prospects of the federal government increasing the share of his realized income that he must pay in taxes. Last year Dr. North paid approximately $277,000 in income taxes, see Table 3 to 3. This may seem like a big buy. But look at it through the eyes of Dr. North. He looks at income tax more as a portion of his total wealth than a portion of his realized income. What if the government doubled the tax rate on high incomes? This is very unlikely, but just as an example, Dr. North would then have to pay the equivalent of 8% of his wealth each year. By comparison, Dr. South would be at a wealth rate of 150%. Is it any wonder Dr. North is much less concerned about paying increasingly higher federal income taxes than Dr. South is? Table 3 to 3. Income and Wealth Contrasts. 2. Increased Government Spending in the Federal Deficit. Dr. South is very concerned about this issue. He believes that increased spending on the part of the government will translate into higher taxes on his income. Dr. North is not overly concerned for the reasons stated above. 3. A high rate of inflation. Dr. South is also concerned that such government action as increased spending and an increase in the deficit will precipitate a significant increase in the inflation rate. Dr. South has a moderate level of concern about this issue because he, like many UAWs, keeps trading up to more and more expensive homes, cars, clothes, and so on. On the other hand, Dr. North feels that inflation will significantly increase the value of at least part of his investment portfolio. 4. Increased government regulation of business and industry. Most physicians feel that this type of government action is targeted at them. They interpret increases in government regulation as preceding the advent of socialized medicine. Both physicians feel that this would have a dampening effect on the fees they generate for their professional services. Dr. South indicated that this issue is of significant concern to him, while Dr. North viewed such action as only a minor concern. Why do these two respondents perceive things so differently? The actions of the government are often a threat to high-income earners who use most of their incomes to support their lifestyles. This is especially true when there is political gain for those in power in targeting the wealthy. Actually, the people the politicians are targeting are high-income earners. Most politicians don't understand the difference between having a high income and having high levels of wealth. They have a more difficult time targeting people with high levels of net worth. Most millionaires who are PAWS are self-employed. Being self-employed gives one much more control over one's economic future than does working for others. Conversely, employees today, even high-income producing executives, have less control over their livelihoods than ever before. Downsizing, for example, is taking its toll, even among the most productive employees. More often than not, even high-income producing employees are not likely to be millionaires. UAWs who are employees, not self-employed are particularly vulnerable to external forces that threaten their ability to earn a living. We found that only 19% of PAWS versus 36% of high-income producing non-millionaires (UAWs) were concerned about having their jobs eliminated, see Table 3 to 4. But in spite of the handwriting that is often on the wall, even most high-income earning employees are consumption-oriented. 
Financial Goals, Words vs. Deeds Many high-income producing PAWS and UAW share similarly stated goals concerning wealth accumulation. For example, more than three-fourths of both groups indicated they had the following goals. To become wealthy by the time they retire. To increase their wealth. To become wealthy through capital appreciation. To build their capital while conserving the value of their assets. But having a set of stated goals does not necessarily mean that one is committed to achieving them. Most of us want to be wealthy, but most of us do not spend the time, energy, and money required to enhance our chances of realizing this goal. Time Allocation Most PAWs agree with the following statements, while most UAWs disagree. I spend a lot of time planning my financial future. Usually, I have sufficient time to handle my investments properly. When it comes to the allocation of my time, I place the management of my own assets before my other activities. Table 3 to 4 Concerns, Fears, and Worries, Pause versus Was Conversely, UAWs tend to agree with the following statements. I can't devote enough time to my investment decisions. I'm just too busy to spend much time with my own financial affairs. Pause and was also differ in the amount of time they actually allocate to planning their investments. Planning is typically found to be a strong habit among people who have a demonstrated propensity to accumulate wealth. Planning and wealth accumulation are significant correlates even among investors with modest incomes. In our survey of 854 middle-income respondents, see Table 3 to 5, for example, a strong positive correlation was found between investment planning and wealth accumulation. One of the more interesting findings in our studies of the affluent relates to why many people spend so little time planning their investments. Many people who do little or no investment planning often feel the way these respondents did. It's hopeless. I never have the time needed to make it pay off. We never have made so much. But the more we earn, the less we seem to accumulate. Our careers take up all our time. I don't have 20 hours a week to fill with investing my money. But pause do not spend anywhere near 20 hours a week in this way. If you study table 3 to 5, you will notice that. On average, even prodigious accumulators of wealth do not need to devote a large proportion of their time to planning their investment strategies. Table 3 to 5. Investment Planning and Demographic Contrasts, Middle Income Pause versus Was. One expected net worth was computed via the wealth equation. Expected net worth equals one tenth age times annual realized household income. We found that these middle income pause spend an average of only 8.4 hours per month planning their investments. This translates to about 100.8 hours per year. Given that there are 8,760 hours in a year, PAWS allocate approximately 1.2% of their time planning their investments. UAWs, on average, spend 4.6 hours per month planning their investments, or about 55.2 hours per year. In other words, PAWS spend an average of 83% more hours, 100.8 versus 55.2, planning per month than do UAWs. UAWs allocate only 1 in 160 hours of their total available time to planning their investments. PAWS allocate 1 in 87 hours. Will UAWs automatically become PAWS simply by doubling the number of hours they devote to planning their investments? Not likely. Planning is only one of many key ingredients in building wealth. Most PAWS have a regimented planning schedule. Each week, each month, each year, they plan their investments. They also start planning at a much earlier age than do UAWs. UAWs, on the other hand, are much like some overweight people who occasionally starve themselves to reach their ideal weight. But more often than not, they regain all the weight they lost and more. UAWs may start the new year with a plan that outlines a variety of investment goals. These goals may be the product of a couple of days of aggressive planning that specifies the number of dollars allocated to investments. Also included in the plan may be a significant gold turkey reduction in the consumption of goods and services. More often than not, this shock planning and corresponding radical change in lifestyle are so severe that they do not work. The typical UAW, in this case, quickly becomes disenchanted with his new model for wealth building. Soon he falls off the wagon, once again breaking his promise of planning, investing more, and consuming less. Many UAWs think that a professionally prepared plan will make them pause overnight, but even the best financial plans are ineffective if you don't follow them. All too often UAWs think that others can lose weight for them. The UAWs in such cases would greatly benefit from understanding how PAWS operate. PAWS do a little planning each and every month. Again, only about 8 hours a month. 
UAWs might do more planning if they knew that it would not require them to quit their day jobs. Paws build wealth slowly. They do not live a Spartan existence, but they do have a regimen when it comes to balancing working, planning, investing, and consuming. Your time is your own. The work factor is an important part of understanding the differences between PAWS and UAWs. Note in our study of middle income respondents the percentage, 59.1 versus 24.7, of PAWS versus UAWs who are self employed. See Table 3 to 5. In this study, self employment correlated significantly with planning investments. Overall, the self employed spend more time planning their investment strategies than those who work for others. The self employed, even those with middle incomes, typically integrate investment planning into their work lives. Most employees, in sharp contrast, have a set of job-related tasks that are independent of planning their investment strategies. Why is this so? Those who succeed among the ranks of the self-employed never take their economic position for granted. Most middle-aged people who are self-employed have seen good as well as bad economic times. They tend to offset the inevitable changes in their revenue by planning and investing. They must build and manage their pension plans by themselves. They have to rely on themselves for their current and future financial situations. More often than not, only the well-disciplined self-employed survive economically over the long run. But, you may ask, don't these people work long and hard? Yes, most successful people who are self-employed work 10 to 14 hours per day. In fact, this is why many employees shy away from even considering going out on their own. They want something less demanding. They want to be employees. But most workers, even those with middle-level incomes, also work long and hard. As for employees who earn annual incomes in the upper five or lower six digits, much of their time and energy is allocated to their jobs. They usually don't have the benefit of writing their own job descriptions. And their occupational tasks typically don't include setting aside a few hours per week to plan their investments. In contrast, the self-employed, especially in the high-income category, have a different set of occupational goals. One of them is to become financially independent. Conversely, employees are too often fully dependent on their employers. Thus they tend to be less self-reliant when it comes to planning their investments in a way that will facilitate accumulating wealth. There is another issue to consider in the planning equation. UAWs spend less time planning their investments than do PAWs, in part because of the nature of their investments. UAWs consider cash slash near cash and equivalents, such as savings accounts, money market funds, and short-term treasury bills, to be investments. UAWs are nearly twice as likely as PAWs to hold at least 20% of their total wealth in cash slash near cash. Most of these cash categories are federally insured. Most are easily accessed when consumption needs arise. And, of course, it takes less time to plan cash-related investments than it does to allocate wealth the way PAWs tend to do. PAWs are more likely to invest in categories that usually appreciate in value but do not produce realized income. They tend to have a greater percentage of their wealth invested in privately held slash closely held businesses, commercial real estate, publicly traded equities, and their pension plans slash annuities and other tax deferred categories. These types of investments require planning. They are also the foundation for wealth. UAWs hold a larger percentage of their wealth in motor vehicles and other assets that tend to depreciate. Active or inactive trader? Nearly all, 95%, of the millionaires we surveyed own stocks. Most have 20% or more of their wealth in publicly traded stocks. Yet you would be wrong to assume that these millionaires actively trade their stocks. Most don't follow the ups and downs of the market day by day. Most don't call their stock brokers each morning to ask how the London market did. Most don't trade stocks in response to daily headlines in the financial media. Do you define active investors as people who, on average, keep an investment for days? Of the millionaires we interviewed, Fewer than 1% of those who own stock are in this league. How about weeks? Another 1%. Let's move up to those who, on average, hold on for months but less than a year. Fewer than 7% are monthly investors. Overall, only about 9% of the millionaires we have interviewed hold their investments for less than one year. In other words, fewer than 1 in 10 millionaires are active investors. 1 in 5, 20%, hold, on average, for a year or two, 1 in 4. 25%, hold for between 2 and 4 years. About 13% are in the 4 to 6 year category. More than 3 in 10, 32%, hold their investments for more than 6 years. In fact, 42% of the millionaires we interviewed for our latest survey had made no trades whatsoever in their stock portfolios in the year prior to the interview. 
The so-called active investor is one of the more difficult types of millionaires to find for interview purposes. He may be an ideal target market for stockbrokers. He certainly spends considerable amounts for brokerage fees related to his trading. But he represents a very small minority of the millionaire population. In fact, we have encountered more non-millionaire active traders than millionaires who actively trade. How can this be possible? Because it is very expensive to buy and sell, buy and sell, buy and sell one's equity holdings each day or week or month. Often, active investors spend more time trading than studying and planning their investments. Conversely, millionaires spend more time studying far fewer offerings. Thus, they can focus their time and energy, the resources needed to master their understanding of a much smaller variety of offerings in the market. We have always been interested in studying the wealth accumulation habits of stockbrokers. Compared with the members of other industries, stockbrokers earn high incomes. They have access to large amounts of research data. Also, they pay less than other people when they trade securities because they earn their own commissions. Are all these high income producing investment advisors wealthy? Not by a long shot. We have asked many stockbrokers about this issue. Perhaps one individual stockbroker stated it best when he told us. I'd be rich if I would just keep my stocks, but I can't help but make trades in my own portfolio. I'm looking at the screen every day. Keep in mind that this broker's net annual income is in excess of $200,000. But because he's a very active investor, he rarely allows the investment seeds he sows to grow. Any short-term realized gains he enjoys are taxed immediately. He is not the type of broker a millionaire prefers to patronize. Then what type do they prefer? Far less active investors. They prefer to deal with those who believe in buying based on considerable studying and then holding. Let's return to our case studies, Doctors North and South, to see financial planning in action. Comparing times. Dr. North allocates about 10 hours in a typical month, or 120 hours a year, to studying and planning his future investment decisions, see Table 3 to 6. In contrast, Dr. South allocates 3 hours a month, or fewer than 40 hours a year. Table 3 to 6. Hours allocated, Dr. North versus Dr. South contrasted with samples of pause and was. Who spends more time managing his current investments? Again, the answer is predictable. Drive. North, on average, allocates about 20 hours a month, or 240 hours in a typical year, for this purpose, while his counterpart reported spending only one hour per month managing his current investments. Certainly, this is a contributing factor to Dr. South's low net worth. Dr. North is a focused investor. He has two favorite investment categories, agricultural land and stocks from the medical industry. First, a fellow I attended medical school with, he saved the life of a patient who believed in investing in grade A agriculture slash orchards. My colleague invested and told me about it. He told me that these people were very honest. I met them and agreed. I have been investing ever since, still investing regularly today. I have made most in the stock market from the medical industry. Drug companies and medical instrument companies, I know this area. I do research on the medical drug field. That's what Warren Buffett does, invests in companies that he knows and understands. But you must have seed money, savings to invest, in areas you have knowledge. I have over $2 million in my profit sharing plan. Dr. South is responsible for making the major investment decisions in his family. It was his decision to have accounts at four different full service brokerage firms. But surprisingly, Dr. South has less than $200,000 in securities. Then why does he have four different financial advisors? Because he believes, incorrectly, that he does not need to spend time making his own investment decisions. He admitted to us that he would be really affluent if he did not take advice from these so-called experts. But even bad advice does not come cheap. We estimated that Dr. South spent over $35,000 in a single year for advice and trades related to his poorly performing $200,000 portfolio. What about Dr. North? During the same period he spent $0 for transaction fees and $0 for financial advice. He is his own financial advisor. He rarely sells stocks. Also, there are no transaction fees for his direct investing in farmland and its products. Dr. South, in traditional UAW fashion, has been burned by financial advisors. Too often people in his position respond to cold calls from brokers who are touting the stock of the week. Too often Dr. South is late entering the up market and exits it too early. In sharp contrast, most of the PAWs we have interviewed make their own investment decisions. They take the time and energy to study investment opportunities. They consult with financial advisors, but ultimately their investment decisions are their own.
Dr. South has a history of trading rapidly among his broker's flavors of the month. He spends many dollars for these trades. If these flavors appreciate in value, they precipitate capital gains taxes. On the other hand, when stocks in a pension plan are traded, they are not subject to capital gains taxes. Unfortunately, Dr. South is not a big fan of pension plans. We estimated that he had less than $40,000 in his plan at the time of our interview with him. Who are your suppliers? How did you hire your household's financial advisor? Did you list the position in the help wanted section of your local newspaper? Did you evaluate the stacks of resumes your advertisement generated? Or did you ask your accountant, attorney, or minister to help you find a quality advisor? Many people tell us that such methods are just too much work. This is unfortunate. The more intellect, time, and energy you spend in hiring a financial advisor, the more likely you will be to find a suitable one. Perhaps you're not convinced about the need to exert yourself in this task. Look at it another way. How much time and effort did it take you to find your most recent employment position? What are the chances that you could call General Motors, IBM, or Microsoft and obtain a job today by phone? What theme would you use? Hi, I'm a Red Hot potential employee. I can greatly enhance the productivity of any department in which I'm placed. I'm smart, efficient, positive, personable, well-groomed, resourceful, and have empathy for the needs of others. When do you want me to start? Your chances of being hired by placing a telephone call, especially a cold call, are near zero. Then why do so many people hire their financial advisor after he or she made a cold call to them? Because they are not experienced in hiring employees. Why aren't you as wealthy as you should be? It may be because of the way you operate your household. Would a business, especially a very productive one, ever hire a key employee without doing a serious background check in an in-depth interview? No. Yet most people, even those with high incomes, hire financial advisors after obtaining little or no background information about these employment candidates. Some high-income people have responded to our views on this topic by stating, but I'm not hiring an employee, I'm just doing some investing with a fellow who called on me. Our response to such statements is simple, operate your household like a productive business. The best businesses hire the best people. They also patronize the best suppliers. Utilizing the best human resources and top suppliers are two major reasons the most productive organizations succeed while others fail. You should view all financial advisors who solicit you as a client merely as applicants. View them as prospective employees or suppliers for your household. Then ask yourself some simple questions. What criteria would a productive personnel manager use in evaluating each of these applicants? Would a skilled purchasing agent and or a chief financial officer of an organization buy investment information and products from this potential supplier? What criteria, what key pieces of background information, would be used to evaluate potential suppliers? Before a well-run business would ever hire a financial advisor or a supplier of investment intellect, it would insist on many vital pieces of hard copy, including the following. Several references. An official college transcript. A credit check. A series of personal interviews. Completion of a detailed employment application. Documents attesting to the ability of the applicant to perform the duties and tasks required. Your ability to hire high-grade financial advisors is directly related to your propensity to accumulate wealth. This, in turn, relates to one of the fundamental reasons business owners outpace all other occupational categories in accumulating wealth. Most high-income business owners have more experience in evaluating potential suppliers, employee applicants, and human resources in general than do individuals in other occupational groups. Being in business requires the constant evaluation of such resources. The Martin Method Several years ago we had the pleasure of interviewing Mr. Martin, a very astute investor and a self-made millionaire. Mr. Martin participated in a focus group interview we conducted with eight multimillionaires. To be included in the group. Respondents had to have a net worth of $5 million or more. Building a net worth of $5 million or more in one generation is quite an accomplishment. But Mr. Martin is rare even within this category, since he never had an earned annual income, from employment, of more than $75,000. How did Mr. Martin become so wealthy? He is one of the best investors we have ever interviewed. Mr. Martin made his fortune via the stock market. We found him to be extremely bright and well informed about various investments. He is also an excellent judge of investment advisors. As you may expect, Mr. Martin subscribes to a wide variety of investment-related publications. Several of these sell their mailing lists to brokers. Thousands of financial advisors have access to Mr. Martin's address and telephone number. 
Mr. Martin estimates that each week at least three or four brokers attempt to solicit his investment dollars via cold calls. How does Mr. Martin deal with these callers? He instructs his secretary to follow the Martin method, which is used to debrief all callers. What is the Martin method? Here is what he told us during the interview. I am a businessman who goes out and tests people. Brokers call me a lot. They say, I have a great deal of experience in Wall Street's best offerings. I have a fantastic track record of making money for my clients. I always say, do you have some good investment ideas for me, really good? He says, absolutely, especially if you're willing to make trades in your portfolio. I only handle accounts with a minimum of $200,000. Then I tell him, so you're really good. Well, I'll tell you what. Send me a copy of your personal income tax returns from the last few years and a list of what you have had in your own portfolio for the past three years. If you made more money than I did from investments, I'll invest with you. Here's my address. When they say, we can't show that to you, I tell them, you are likely to be full of baloney. This is my strategy for checking people out. It works. I check them all out this way. I mean it very honestly. Perhaps you're asking yourself how Mr. Martin finds time to evaluate all those stacks of credentials he receives from cold callers. During the many years Mr. Martin has been an active investor, he has received countless telephone solicitations. How many of these solicitors applied for the job as financial advisor to the Martin household by submitting their credentials? Zero. Not one of the dozens. Of cold callers submitted his income and wealth appreciation data to Mr. Martin. According to Mr. Martin, if these guys were really good, they would not spend all their time calling me. Well, fair enough, Mr. Martin. But not everyone in America has your investment intellect, income, and net worth. Many people would be better off financially if they use the services of a financial advisor, even one who cold called them, for the simple reason that most financial advisors are significantly more knowledgeable about investing than the average high-income UAW. How one comes into contact with one's financial advisor is a correlate of wealth appreciation. How did Mr. Martin come into contact with his? Like the majority of PAWS, he used interpersonal communication. Early in his career he asked his accountant for a referral to a quality financial advisor. The accountant provided the names of several such advisors. Mr. Martin also asked for referrals from those of the accountant's clients whose investments always seemed to do well. Mr. Martin has patronized several financial advisors since first being introduced via his accountant. He also relies on others for investment advice, including his attorney and CPA. Mr. Martin always felt his financial advisors were credible sources of investment wisdom because all were endorsed by his CPA and or his CPA's most successful investors. Also, Mr. Martin reasoned quite correctly that these financial advisors would treat him as a special client. And, indeed, they went out of their way to provide him with good advice and timely forecasts. Why? To do otherwise would jeopardize their relationships with their referral network. What would Mr. Martin do if his advisors provided him with poor service and low quality advice? He would complain to the CPA who endorsed these people. The CPA would not enjoy losing Mr. Martin as a client and would likely cast these advisors out of his referral network. No financial advisor would enjoy being fired in this way. Even better great advisors seem to turn up their level of service for members of important referral networks. What is to be learned from this case scenario? Choose a financial advisor who is endorsed by an enlightened accountant and or his clients with investment portfolios that in the long run outpace the market. If you don't have an accountant, hire one. Another correlate of wealth accumulation is employment of a CPA, not just to do taxes but also to provide various kinds of investment advice. To find a high quality accountant, ask friends or associates who fit the PAW profile. You may wish to call the accounting department at your state's university. Speak with several accounting faculty. Ask them for the names of their former students who have established track records in helping clients make enlightened financial decisions. Another method is to call the local offices of national accounting firms, which are often very selective in their hiring. Even large firms have many smaller accounting slash financial planning clients. We selected our CPAs based on two criteria. First, the CPAs were recommended by professors of accounting. Second, the CPAs were initially hired out of college by major accounting firms and later started their own successful accounting firms. We find that many of the very best CPAs and financial planners follow this career path. Some CPAs are better than others at helping clients accumulate wealth. Interview several. Choose the one who has the highest concentration of pauses clients. You may have to explain the concept to them. 